when I saw this news about the fact that one transaction seems to have been filtered out of uh, the mining, so basically someone tried to censor a transaction, I was very much alert because the uncensorability is in my eyes one of the most important um, properties of Bitcoin, which uh, makes it different to any other form of money or cryptocurrency that we have. And it gives it a lot of the properties that are needed um, to use Bitcoin as a tool for freedom, for privacy, for human rights activists and against uh, authoritarianism. And as you might know, that's actually the focus of my work. And so I was very alarmed by that. And um, so Bitcoin without the censorship resistance is useless because then we can just use PayPal, credit cards or central bank digital currencies. And Satoshi Nakamoto built Bitcoin to be exactly the alternative to the current financial system. And as I said before, in October 2023, so one and a half months ago or something, one of the mining pools, F2 pool, which is the third largest mining pool globally, globally uh, seems to have censored a transaction. And this filtered transaction is part of the OFAC list of sanctioned Bitcoin addresses. So the American, the US American OFAC, a um, not really voted for institution, um, is blacklisting Bitcoin addresses um, that they get, think uh, are linked to terrorists or, or money laundering or whatever. And the payment went through because all the other miners included it into their blocks. Only F2 pool didn't include it. And there's a Bitcoin developer who's going by the name 0xB10C. And they published uh, this finding in November, on November 21st, and found the missing transaction with the tool with a tool that uh, this guy developed, it's called Mining Pool Observer. And this tool aims to detect when mining pools are not mining transactions they could have been mining. Um, as far as I know, that project um, is basically um, financed by the Human Rights Foundation. So that person got a grant from the Human Rights Foundation because, of course, for the Human Rights Foundation, it's also important to find out if someone tries to censor transactions. While I was researching for this article, I found a tweet uh, from a certain person called Sato Fishi on uh, Twitter. And this Sato Fishi wrote, a censorship resistant system must be designed to resist censorship at the protocol level, rather than relying on each participant to act conscientiously and refrain from censorship. The internet and TCP IP have failed this. Bitcoin should learn from the failure. And I was, it was weird because people like, um, the Blue Matt, Matt Corello, or Adam Beck, which are core developers, um, answered this guy. And um, then I found out that, that this person seems to be the founder, co-founder, or whatever CEO maybe of F2 Pool. And I found an earlier tweet of Sato Fishi, where he admitted that he, to F2 pool basically, censored that transaction because he refuses to confirm transactions for criminals, dictators, and terrorists. He later deleted that tweet. But there are screenshots on Twitter that you can find. So Sato Fishi really decided to censor this transaction and I really wonder now, was this either a message from F2 pool that mining censorship can and will happen in the future and that the community of developers and users should increase the censorship resistance on the network? Or um, he's he really just said, I don't want to go to jail. I'm, I'm the miner 
And if the US Americans sense, want these transactions to be censored, then I do that because I don't want to end like uh, C said from Binance or other people. He doesn't want to go to jail, of course. So the big question is, has Bitcoin lost its uncensorability? The short answer is no, because F2 pool is a mining pool. And a mining pool is actually only a piece of software that runs in the cloud where a group of miners come together voluntarily to combine their computing power and resources in order to increase the chances of successfully mining a block and earning the associated rewards, the block reward. And F2 pool is not the only mining pool out there. There are others. And all the others did not censor this transaction. That means um, these mining pools consist of a lot of people or hashing machines that are pooled together. And if an individual miner doesn't want uh, censorship on, in, the, in, the, in the pool, then they can switch to another pool very fast. So, and the second thing is censoring Bitcoin addresses in general doesn't make a lot of sense as one can use thousands of addresses. So just <laughs> use new addresses, you know. But the longer answer is it's a slippery slope. It shows that mining pools today are often corporate entities. They are huge um, <laughs> buildings with a lot of, with thousands of machines. And they, of course, will have to comply with the regulations in their jurisdiction. And one of the biggest mining pools, Foundry USA, is already KYC mining only. That means that all the individual miners who are in that pool together are personally identified, like just like if you are verified on a centralized crypto exchange. Um, and whereas F2 pool is located in Asia, which makes it weird that they were the first one to comply with the US OFAC blacklist. But it shows that mining pools, just like banks, can over-enforce regulations in anticipatory obedience. With that, they further increase and invite stricter regulations. It's a vicious cycle which culminates in tight KYC regulations, data collection, and financial surveillance, which is doing more harm than good, as we know. I mean, just think about all the personal data that is already being collected, breached, and now available on the internet. So KYC in general is not effective. Um, the financial and human costs outweigh the results. I mean, there's still terrorism, right? There's still money laundering. Um, KYC doesn't help. The only ones who are profiting are regulators, lawyers, surveillance corporations, and bureaucrats resulting in ever stricter surveillance and control. So if you go down that slippery slope further and further, we will find ourselves in the situation that Bitcoin might hard fork in the future with the outcome that we have a KYC corporate Bitcoin and a free Bitcoin, the people's Bitcoin, which they will call the black market Bitcoin. That would be a costly situation and also at the moment, I mean, when a hard fork is happening, of course, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, an insecurity. The, the price of Bitcoin might fall. And while at the moment there is no danger that this happens, um, we see that more and more corporations and also institutions coming in like BlackRock, all the ETFs that might be um, possible are starting in January. Um, with all these institutions and corporations coming in, they, of course, have to follow the KYC rules and all the regulations. So they will start mining, uh, sorry, uh, censoring transactions. So 
And then we are back to the same exclusive financial system that we already have, and we have won nothing. But in the end, we still might have the new people's Bitcoin, which doesn't censor transactions. So what are possibilities to mitigate that? What should happen actually now? Uh, better the, as fast as possible, actually. So home mining. Home mining would be really a great alternative. Um, it sh the, the censorship shows that it's in, important that individuals or small power producers are starting to mine. Um, as long as you have access to cheap electricity or excess power, um, Bitcoin mining at home is possible. And that's a measurement to keep Bitcoin mining decentralized. I mean, that's even possible in countries like in Zimbabwe, which is sanctioned by the US. But we have a Bitcoin miner somewhere in Zimbabwe, and I'm going to meet him maybe later this year, or in the next weeks, because the year is almost over. Um, another um, measure to uh, keep Bitcoin decentralized and also to disable basically the possibility to my, uh, censor transactions is a new protocol for pooled mining, which is called Stratum V2. It's in development and it enables the individual miners within a pool to select the transactions that they want to mine in the next block themselves. At the moment, in all mining pools, the mining pool software of the centralized entity is deciding which transactions are put in the next uh, block. And so Stratum V2 is a great opportunity um, for that, for censorship resistance. And I mean, it went fast in the last two weeks. Last week, I read that there's a new mining pool, which is called Demand. And they started the first Stratum V2 mining pool. So they are already using Stratum V2. And it's also for solo miners. And then, I think it was last week, there was the new big headline. Um, and that's regarding also the third question um, we, I was talking about before, is ocean ocean mining. Ocean mining was launched last week uh, in an event with uh, Jack Dorsey, uh, who seems to have um, given like six million dollars uh, to the development of this, uh, the pool. And um, the, the founder is Luke DeCheer Jr., who is a Bitcoin core developer who already, um, I would say even like 10 years ago, if I remember correctly, I already had a mining pool software um, and this ocean seems to be the new version of this uh, mining pool software. And the, the slogan was, we want to keep Bitcoin decentralized. Um, <laughs> we are not censoring transactions. And then uh, it's also planned that they adopt Stratum V2. They are not using it at the moment, but there are plans to uh, use it soon. And then suddenly on Twitter, there were a lot of tweets about how um, Luke Detchier is an opponent of ordinals because they uh, raise the fees on chain. And um, many people, I mean, ordinals are basically like NFTs. It's like uh, images on the blockchain. And so there are a lot of these ordinals and they drive the transaction fees higher and higher. And a few people think uh, ordinals have no place in Bitcoin. Bitcoin is first and foremost money or a digital asset. And this is its function. And they don't want any other use of um, Bitcoin on Bitcoin. <laughs> and um, so there was a lot of talk about how they already are censoring ordinal transactions. But to be honest, I'm not sure if they really do. And um, so we will see going forward what's happening. 
In any case, it's good when new uh, mining pools who are dedicated to do non-KYC mining and uh, also implement Stratum V2 are coming up. And um, we were talking about the centralization of Bitcoin. So the mining pools, yes, one could say this is centralization. But as I said before, the individual miners can move very fast to another mining pool. So that was not really a problem and it's not, not yet, yeah? And uh, decentralization is like um, with privacy. You don't have uh, zero decentralization or 100% decentralization. Um, the same with you can't, you, you, it's always a, like on a slider, you know, uh, it's not zero or one. And with decentralization, it's the same. Um, in Bitcoin, we try to, have the most possible decentralization that is possible with the current uh, technology. And um, that's one of the reasons why in 2017 with the block war, block size wars, um, it came to the hard fork because the Bcash people thought um, we can increase the block size. And the Bitcoiners said, no, uh, we shouldn't increase the block size because then people in countries who have uh, bad internet connections or also very expensive internet cannot participate anymore. They can't run their own node anymore. They can't download the blockchain. And so this was one very important um, decision to stay more decentralized. And um, another option to prevent censoring of transactions is, of course, to increase privacy. Um, so Adam Beck proposed committed transactions already in 2013. And, um, but this technical solution seems to be the most far out. So because that technology would render BTC addresses private for miners, so they couldn't see the addresses and uh, then a blacklist doesn't make any sense anymore. But I don't believe that this is a solution that will be done fast because as you see already in 2013, Adam Beck proposed it. Another uh, thing you can do to help decentralize Bitcoin or keep it decentralized is to run a node, either a lightning node or a Bitcoin node. Because as you know, each Bitcoin node holds a copy of the blockchain and each of these nodes can also decide which Bitcoin core software it is running. And in the case of a hard fork, the node runner's decision on which version of the software they run is maintaining the network. So the node runners decide over a soft fork or a hard fork not the miners. And so to conclude, the good and the bad, basically. If I put on a pessimistic lens um, and follow the 80 to 20 Pareto principle, I, I assume that maybe 80% 80 of all miners will bow to regulations, just like, I guess, 80% of Bitcoin users will have their Bitcoin in custody. In case this turns out to be true, it could be that we see a hard fork in the future. But um, the optimistic outcome is that in a censorship resistant Bitcoin chain, um, that this chain will most probably survive, even though it will be a smaller network than the KYC, the, the corporation Bitcoin. Thanks for watching. I've got one question for you. Did you know that all my work is free to use and I'm not sponsored by any companies to stay an independent source of Bitcoin education and knowledge? Therefore, please consider donating towards my nonprofit initiative Bitcoin for Fairness or join my membership program Crack the Orange, where you not only can learn more about Bitcoin, but will also have access to me. You can ask me questions for my live calls and you will receive the newest content first 
and be a part of a greater community of learners. You can learn more about these options at anita.link/donate. Thank you very much. Thank you.